1943, a regularly scheduled flight of a commercial airline was coming in from the west, carrying three passengers from Soviet Russia. They had left Moscow about one week before, had landed at Fairbanks, Alaska, were now on their way to Ottawa, the capital of Canada. One of the passengers was Colonel Alexandra Chagorin, the new military attaché to the Soviet embassy in Canada. The other was Major Semyon Kulyan, his aide and secretary. The third was Igor Guzenko, a specially trained cipher clerk and decoding expert. It was Guzenko's first time out of Soviet Russia. As soon as they landed, they were taken to the Soviet embassy, interviewed by Ilya Ranyev, second secretary of the embassy and chief of the NKVD, the Soviet secret police. I'm now in a foreign country and must always be alert against enemies. I must be careful of all manner of acquaintanceship. I must not engage in cordial conversation with any foreigner whatsoever. Never borrow money from a foreigner. In my apartment, I must be respectful to neighbors but make no friends. I must never permit myself to be more drunk than either my guests or my host. A sober brain, a firm tongue, and alertness. These things must always be with me when I'm with foreigners. Where were you born? Rogachova. You were in the Red Army? Yes. What branch? Military Intelligence, Cypher Division. I received instructions in coding and decoding at the Secret Intelligence School, Moscow. I'm also a member of the Young Communist League. What is your duty here? Cypher Clerk, Military Attaché's office. What do you know about this idiot? He was assigned to me by headquarters military intelligence. Before you left Moscow, you were given certain answers to the questions I just asked you. Why didn't you use them? I'm sorry, Comrade Ranyev. I thought with you... You will give those answers to everyone, no matter who. You will think, eat, sleep, breathe those answers until you know no others. Where were you born? In the town of Gwerki, Stoljoni Street. What school? Economics Technical Institute. What's your duty? I'm employed by the military attaché as translator and secretary. Have you ever been a soldier? No, never. That's better. I give only one warning. As a cipher clerk, you're a fountain of information. No one, not even members of the embassy staff, must know who you are and what your work is. No one will know. One more thing. It will be wise never to forget that even on foreign soil, you're a Soviet citizen and soldier. I could never forget that, Comrade Ranyev. We'll see. Bushkin will take you to the cipher section. That's all. Karamova, come in, please. My secretary, Nina Karanova, Colonel Trigorin, Major Kulin. An unexpected pleasure. Will you have dinner with me tonight? Karanova. We'll handle this matter yourself. Yes, Comrade Johnny. You haven't answered my question. Cold fish, isn't she? Bell is here. Comrade Lieutenant Vinikov, this is Lieutenant Igor Guzenko, the new military attache cipher clerk. He's yours from now on. I hope you like music. Ranyev's cipher clerk uses that room. That one belongs to the diplomatic cipher clerk. This is the washroom. The small incinerator is in the bar room to your left, the large one to the right. 
This is yours. No one is permitted in this section except authorized persons. You will give me all messages for transmission. When you're finished with the code books, you'll give them to the chief of the cipher section who'll put them in his safe. He's the only one that knows the combination. When your day's work is done, every scrap of paper must be burnt. Every drawer and the door of the safe must be sealed with the top secret seal. And don't ask me why the church means top secret. I don't know. You'll take no papers from this room without showing them to me first. And don't ask to have the music turned off. It's a rule. The music must always play. So no one can hear what's being said in the other offices. I hate music. Karanova, Ranyev's secretary, was extremely friendly to Gozienko. She had introduced herself to him, offered to help find him an apartment. His first night in Ottawa, they met in front of the Chateau Laurier. They went to a gay restaurant. Gozienko discovered that Canadians were a happy people, who even in wartime seemed to enjoy themselves. danced until closing time, and then they went to her apartment. This is your apartment? Mm -hmm. You live here all alone? Alone. This is good enough for a commissar. I spend every penny I earn on this apartment. You think you could find me one like it? We'll try. I'll ask the manager in the morning. Pour yourself a drink. I'll be right back. Living must be cheap over here. It was cheaper in Tokyo. Do you live there? In the Soviet Embassy. Berlin, too. Were you a secretary in Berlin? And in Tokyo. I was trained for the diplomatic service. Perhaps we went to the same schools. I went to the Economic Technical Institute. Any others? Did you have a drink? I'll have another. And you? No. No more tonight. Well, you may sit next to me. You must be very tired. It was a long journey. Here. Let me make you more comfortable. <laughs> I might fall asleep. When do you begin work? Tomorrow. Is your office in the embassy? Yes. Oh, good. And we'll see lots of each other. Have another drink? Good, plenty. Oh. Here in Canada, there's plenty of everything. <laughs> It's always been very quiet at the military attaché's office. The arrival of men like you and Colonel Trigorin could promise great changes. Does it? Well, of course. Ah, it's wonderful. Makes the stomach dance. I am getting sleepy. Well, then rest. Because tomorrow you'll have to work very hard. There'll be messages. Many secret messages. Isn't that true? I'm a very important person. With all kinds yes. of important secrets. Listen, I'll tell you one. My wife is very beautiful. More beautiful than I? Hers is a quiet kind of beauty. Soft and warm. 
And mine? Your beauty is a thing carved out of granite. With no body or soul. You're being unfriendly now. Why? You're not very clever. You've been away from Russia too long. Experience has provided new techniques. You should learn them. For one thing, never ask direct questions. And for another, you should never bring a Russian to a place like this for questioning. This might dull the wits of these Canadians, but to a Russian, it means only one thing. It would be better not to make an enemy of me, Comrade Kozienko. I don't want to make an enemy out of you any more than I want you to make a fool out of me. I drink vodka like a true Russian. I love my wife, and I thank you for everything. And, of course, you will tell the truth about me, because if you don't, I'll have to tell how easy it was to see through you. Good night. I was born in the town of Gwerki, on Stujoni Street. I was never a soldier. Within a few days, Gozienko settled down to the job for which he had been so well trained. The very first message he decoded ordered Trigorin and Raniev to meet someone codenamed Paul. Paul's registration card was in the secret file. Surname, John Grubb, Canadian citizen. Codename, Paul. Detailed material on his biography is available in the center in the coming turn. Get in, gentlemen. I've been expecting you, Trigorin. Welcome to Canada. It's time, you know. It's time they sent someone competent. Canada's important. It'll be more important when we've won this war. Do you understand that? Did they tell you that? My orders are to build a large organization. A large organization? What's that? A mass of people swarming like bees? Or a few smart ones in the right places? Our requirements are quite extensive. For example, Moscow would like to know what chance there is of getting someone on the general staff level. <laughs> They're mad. They'll be asking for the prime minister next. Not until his name is John Grubb. Canada is not yet ready for me. You're not dealing with an amateur, Colonel. I founded the party in Canada in 1920. I'm a graduate of the Lenin School. For your information, I take my orders directly from Moscow, not from the embassy. I sometimes need to remind Ranyev of that. No, you need people in the right places. In the army, the air forces, the navy, the National Research Council, the Department of External Affairs. This is a general list of required information. Stop here. They're asking for a lot, but they'll get it. Good night, gentlemen. House of Commons, members' entrance. Associated Friends of Soviet Russia, one of many front organizations, provided a showcase for potential agents. 
Here, John Grubb could spot those ready for what was called further development. Among them was one Captain Donald Class, a member of the Royal Canadian Air Force, stationed in Ottawa. Now, I have no desire other than to see the war quickly concluded with an Allied victory. And the sooner we open a second front, the sooner we will have peace. Ladies and gentlemen, to our Soviet friends. In addition to the front organizations, there were small private gatherings known as study groups. Here, communist philosophy and techniques were studied, and the writings of Marx, Engels, and Lenin were read and discussed. John Grubb knew that Donald Class belonged to such a group. He passed Class on to Leonard Leitz. Now it was Leitz's job to see if Class had been mentally developed to the point where he could be of practical service to the Soviet Union. I, um, I hope you don't mind my taking you away from Karl Marx, Captain. I know him by heart. Good. I'm glad to see you never miss a study group meeting. I can't think of anything more important. Still editing the military journal? Yes, sir. Your work must bring you in contact with lots of people engaged in secret war projects. Yes, sir. How many of them would you say are sympathetic to us? I've met several at various study groups. Anyone in the National Research Council? Yes. Warren Blair, he's in the radio lab. Will Hollis, he's in radar. Sit down, Captain. Captain Class, all kinds of people come to these Marxist study groups. They fall into two categories. First, there are the talkers. They, of course, are the loudest, the most emotional. <laughs> to some, Marxism is kind of a game they play to rid them of their frustrations. To others, it's a kind of a fashionable cult. We know them for what they are, essentially unreliable, basically cowards. Then there are the doers. They never have too much to say. One can feel in them the fanaticism of the true believer. They understand the deadly earnestness of the class struggle and are ready to make every sacrifice for it. Unfortunately, there are not too many doers. Captain, you can be of service to our party, providing your loyalty is great enough. Let the party try me. It will. Within a few weeks, Captain Donald Class was an active Soviet agent. Through him, Guzienko's files were fattened with new registration cards. Foster, Ernst, Leader, The Professor, Prometheus, Eli, Gray, Frieda, Gaia, and others. All Canadians, all party members. Now they were able to get all kinds of top secret information. Helen Tweedy, code name Nellie, employed as a clerk in the Department of External Affairs. Through her, they were able to invade the most secret diplomatic files. In that way, getting at important information other governments were entrusting to Canada. The web kept growing in size and efficiency. some news for you. News, news. The world is full of news these days. Well, this is something I think... Don't get excited about it. That's what's important. And don't believe everything you hear. Well, this just came from Moscow. Ah. Then you must believe it. 
every word of it. If you don't, Ronyev will get after you. I don't like Ronyev. Watch out for him, my boy. These pencil pushers always make trouble for us soldiers. He doesn't frighten me. Not when I'm drunk. Listen, Comrade Major. Our wives are arriving day after tomorrow. Oh, no. What time? 11.30. If we're lucky, the train will be late. Very late. Comrade Major, my wife will be on that train. Your wife was never a captain in the Red Army. journey. No more till we get to our flat. We have a flat? Three rooms, all our own. No. Yes, three rooms. Dr. Norman? Yes. I'm Leonard Leeds, MP from Montreal. How do you do? My old friend, Dr. Fred Vincent, wrote me you were coming here to work with our National Research Council. I took it upon myself to welcome you to Canada. That's very kind of you. And then after San Francisco, we passed through Chicago and New York. The building is eager. I was made dizzy by the sight of it. I've been waiting weeks to tell you. Something wrong? Oh, no. Very wonderful. I'm going to have a baby. And the months passed quickly for the Gazenkos. It was spring. Whenever he had time away from the embassy, they would go for long walks, exploring what to them was a strange, sometimes disturbing, sometimes puzzling world.
is, these people are politically uneducated. They have no leadership to help them think. Either they don't think at all, or they think as they please. <laughs> it isn't any wonder they get confused. But you haven't yet told me one thing. Ask me anything. You want a boy or a girl? Here I'm being absolutely brilliant on what's wrong with democracy. Don't know. I'm not very interested tonight. Answer my question. Well, naturally. Everybody wants a boy first. Boys have a better future. They grow up to be men. Good evening. Oh, you're pleased to get up. I just stopped by for a moment to ask you to try a piece of this apple pie. Oh, I had such luck with it, it turned out simply delicious. Oh, that's very kind of you. Oh, not at all. It was too much for Albert and me, anyhow. I've seen you often enough before, but we've never met. Oh, I'm sorry. Eager, this is Mrs. Foster, our neighbor. How'd you do? You feeling all right? Very well, thank you. Oh, good. Now, don't forget to call me if you need anything. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Anna. I can't help it if she wants to be friendly. I'm here all day alone. I know. You've been told time and time again. We must not fraternize with Canadians. But this is so complicated. We won't talk about it anymore. We'll do as we're told. You'll keep that woman out of this house from now on. I'm sorry, dear. But we must be very careful. You know that. I'm old at being careful. Igor Gazienko here. That's immediately Colonel Colonel. right away. Something urgent has come up, he said. Couldn't it wait until morning? Of course. But it's like the army. You hurry here so you can wait longer there. It's snowing out. Put a scarf around your neck. I'll get a taxi. If I can. Where's me, Anna? Leaving you here all alone. I'll be all right. Are you sure of that? Of course. The doctor said it would be at least a week more. Doctors are sometimes wrong. Stop worrying, Ika. I feel very well. Get your work done and hurry home. I'll keep the bed warm for you. I'll hurry. Urgent, to the director. The professor reported that the director of the National Chemical Research Committee, Stacy, told him about the new plant under construction. The plant will produce uranium. As a result of experiments being carried out, it has been found that uranium may be used for filling bombs. The Americans have developed wide research work, having invested in this business $660 million. Grant. It's urgent. Everything's always urgent, especially getting back to bed. Someday I'll put a telephone book under my shirt and you'll never notice it. Try it and see. message for you. It came about an hour ago, but I had orders not to disturb you. The 
Your wife's at St. Vincent Hospital. She's given birth to a seven pound, six ounce boy. Both are doing well. A boy! Colonel Dragoran's first uranium message brought an immediate reaction from Moscow. This project was given precedence over every other activity. You know a scientist codenamed Alec? Alec? Yes. We met him when he arrived from England some months ago. He's considered a very brilliant scientist. Good. This just arrived from Moscow. Read it. Alec is a very valuable source, and therefore conduct this operation with as great caution as possible. He is a corporant. I consider it best to establish contact through Paul, director. He may be politically confused. He may need re-educating. We can't afford to waste time. The director has given the uranium project top priority. I'll take care of it myself. What's his code greeting? Best regards from Michael. Yes? Dr. Harold Norman. Yes? Best regards from Michael. Come in, please. Who are you? I am Paul. And you are Alec. You have comfortable quarters here. You can't look at those papers. They're top secret. I wouldn't know what they meant if I looked at them all night. But you do. That's why I'm here. There's nothing I can tell you. You're working in the laboratory of the National Research Council. Yes. You're part of the Atomic Energy Project. What of it? You have a nice phonograph. And Shostakovich. Beautiful, beautiful. The first flowering of a true proletarian culture. Or have you gone over to the capitalist enemy? We're allies now. Russia, England, the United States. It's a people's war against the fascists. Don't be blinded by this alliance. The interests of capitalism and communism can never be the same. As a friend of the worker, as a scientist who has dedicated his life to mankind, you know that. You didn't come here to tell me that. What do you want? Detailed notes on everything having to do with the atomic project. Samples of uranium. Impossible. We're too closely watched. This is the most secret project in history. As a member of the party, you willingly assumed certain responsibilities. In the past, you never gave us reason to question your loyalty. But you don't understand. This is no ordinary explosive. This is a force as powerful as nature, uncontrolled, it could destroy the world. Exactly. And that's why we must all have it. Don't you see? Then they'll not dare use it. Think of it, Dr. Norman. 
you and others like you can help bring peace to the world. Peace and a chance for decent people to build a new, free world. You can't refuse, Dr. Norman. It will be your contribution to the safety of mankind. The safety of mankind. Isotope. Neutron. Plutonium. Chain reaction. Fission. These were new words to Gazenko. Words belonging to an atomic age being born in the laboratories of Canada and the United States. Dr. Norman worked at all of them. Oak Ridge in Tennessee, Hanford in Washington, Chalk River in Petawawa in Canada. The new words were in his report to the Soviet military attaché. Shortly after Germany collapsed, Dr. Norman provided Colonel Trigorin with 10 pages of detailed information on the production processes of the atomic bomb. As a sample, he also handed over a platinum with 162 micrograms of uranium-233. This atomic information, still classified as top secret, was considered so important it was carried by hand to Moscow. Jump in, Doctor. I told you I'd call you uh, when I had something. I have something for you. What? You are being sent back to England. How do you know? We know. Do you deny it? No. I, uh, I just heard it myself. I was going to tell you. In a few days, you will receive further instructions about contacting one of our men in London. You will give him any additional information you have and all the new information you will get. I've done about all I can. This whole business is extremely painful to me. You're becoming a sentimentalist, Dr. Norman. You will receive further instructions within the next few days. tired world sang and danced and laughed. Perhaps at last there would be peace in our time. There must be no misconception about our relations with our former capitalist allies. Our interests can never coincide. Our roads and aims are quite different. We have no place for bourgeois sentimentalism. Only relentless realism. The class struggle will continue until this decadent plutocratic democracy is as completely destroyed as National Socialism. 
Therefore, you, the representatives of the Soviet Union in Canada, will as always remain vigilant, suspicious, and aloof. That will be all. Did you have a nice time? Oh, yes, thank you. Was Andre all right? Not a peep out of him. That's a wonderful boy you have there, Mr. Gazenko, a real little gentleman. Thank you. Is there something wrong, Mr. Gazenko? Oh, no. That is, my husband isn't feeling very well. Oh. Well, if it's his stomach, I've got the most... Oh, no, thank you. He'll be all right if I get him to bed right away. <laughs> In that case, I'll run along this very minute. You were very kind to sit up with Andre. Oh, not at all. I might just as well sit here as in my own apartment. Are you sure that I can't do anything? If it's a headache... Thank you. Nothing. Good night. Oh, very well. I hope you feel better. Good night. Anna. What could I do? You telephoned me at the last moment. Tell me I must come to the embassy immediately for a special meeting. I can't leave Andre alone. Somebody must look after him. Be grateful you have kind neighbors. Anna, you must understand, I'm not the one you who... You look at him. He sleeps so peacefully. Yeah. I'm sorry if I shouted at you, but... Poor little fellow. It would be a pity to have him grow up thinking the world is his enemy. By then, everything will be better. Are you sure, Igor? Are you sure? Anna. I'd listen to Ramiev tonight. And suddenly, suddenly I was sick inside myself. These people are not our enemies. They are our friends. It is we who are acting like enemies. Anna, you must not say these things to me. I can't help it. I'm afraid. For him, for you, for me. Before I came here, I, I believed everything. Now I, I can't even understand. We're simple people, Anna. We can't understand everything. We must have faith in our leaders. We must understand, Nika. We must. For his sake. If I've learned anything here, Ika, I've learned that no human being should ever be forced to live in fear. Ika. No more, Anna. You must not talk like that anymore. I won't listen to you. A wave of jubilation and thanksgiving sweeps the cities of the land at the news of Japan's surrender. San Francisco has gone absolutely wild. Market Street is jam-packed with countless thousands of men and women celebrating the end of the war. Thousands of servicemen waiting to be shipped to the Pacific, many of them veterans of the war in Europe, know their shooting days are done. And are they tearing the town apart? And who can blame them because peace? Isn't it wonderful? To Grant, take measures to organize acquisition of additional documentary materials on the atomic bomb. Present information incomplete. We must have in detail the technical process, drawings, calculations. Director, there is no questioning the urgency of the order. We are doing what we can. It's not enough. You will contact every agent and alert them for atomic information. That's all. Gazenko will remain. Oh, uh, Gazenko, um, uh, uh, telegram to the director. We, uh, 
We have alerted every agent to um, that fantastic mushroom over Hiroshima. I saw the newsreel pictures. I can't get them out of my mind. A beautiful poisonous mushroom. What a weapon. I wish I knew more about it. One little bomb that makes a desert on which nothing can live. What more need you know? Sometimes I think you're a great fool, Kulin. Zierko, do you think I'm a great fool? Don't look at him, look at me. Consider me carefully. I've got blood on both hands and I sleep with dead faces on my eyeballs. You have my permission to shut up, Kulin. Thank you, I told you. Look at me. See if you can look into my mind. We're defending Kharkov. It's snowing. There's blood to wade through. I ask for volunteers for a dangerous patrol. No one volunteers. I shoot ten good Russians between the eyes. Shoot them dead. The eleventh volunteers. I have no more trouble and I have all the volunteers I can use. Come here! As a man, I'm called a sadist. But what of governments that pile dead on dead and justify murder as a means to an end? What name do you call them? You. You simple Russian soul, you answer me. You're making it very difficult for me, my friend. Don't force me to send you back to Russia. <laughs> you. The Zink. Did you hear that? The threat of threats to be sent back to Russia. Why should it have such an ominous sound like the ring of mourning bells or the executioner's volley? Why? Why, you figure it out? Why? Why? Ooh! Go to your quarters. Consider yourself under arrest. Yes. It's about time. I can't stomach it anymore. An efficient firing squad will solve all my problems. It takes too long to drink oneself to death. Too long. <laughs> Zenka, you have a good record, Gazenka. It will remain that way unless you repeat a single word of what happened here. File this. Talk to your comrade, Major. Go away. Why do you say you can't stomach it anymore? What is it makes you willing to, to face a firing squad? I'm drunk. I never know what I say when I'm drunk. Comrade Kulian. You're the son of one of the great heroes of the revolution. Your father was close to Lenin. You're turning away from everything he stands for. Why? My father was once a great revolutionary Marxist. Today, he pays for a living by saying what he's told to say. 
Kulin, you know more than I. Do you think there's going to be another war? War is part of the process leading towards a general upheaval throughout the world that will result in the establishment of world communism. There mustn't be another war. Never again. Listen, Kulin. There must be another way. Tell me the truth. Truth? What's that? I used to know when I was a very little boy. You don't know. You'll never know. You were born too late. It's enough to make even the saddest cry. Now listen to me. I've got a son, and I want to do what's right. Go away, you simple Russian. They'll send you back, too, if they catch you talking to me. Go away. Just talking to Kulin. I'm sending him home, Emma. That was bound to happen. He drinks too much. He drinks to forget. Forget what? Himself. His father. Once Kulin had great respect for his father. Now he has only contempt. He's sick. Sick with disappointment. It's a terrible thing for a father to do to a son. I mustn't do that to Andre. I must think now for him, too. I must tell him what kind of world I want him to live in. What kind of man I want him to be. Someday I'll, I'll have to answer to him. I want to be able to face him without being afraid or ashamed. Maybe I'm wrong, but from what I've seen and learned, I've decided there's only one thing for us to do. Anna, we'll not go back to Russia. <gasps> oh. In the weeks that followed, Guzenko formulated a plan. He selected certain key documents from his secret files very carefully marked each one. The colonel wants to see you in his office immediately. Thanks. What are you doing? Just straightening out my files. Pretty busy, eh? Very busy. No rest for the wicked, huh? <laughs> 
Eager. My old friend, I'm glad to see you. Sergeyev, when did you arrive? Today? Sergeyev is your replacement. You are returning to Russia. Immediately? As soon as you have shown Lieutenant Sergeyev everything he should know, you will work together from now on. Yes, Colonel Kerr. That's all. Comrade I hear you're going home. Yes. Are you happy? Why shouldn't I be happy? You might at least introduce me, Igor. He's not very polite, is he? Comrade Sergeyev, Comrade Karanova. We will see more of each other, I hope. You will. Zenko realized that from now on, his replacement, Sergeyev, would be continually at his side. To complete his plan, he needed to take immediate action. That same night, he returned to the embassy. as efficient as you. Let us all send this off tonight. grumpier every day. I need excitement. Then why don't you lock up the place and come and see a movie with me? Nobody knows the difference. Except you. Go along now before I report you for trying to make me neglect my duty. Quitting already? Yeah. Come here. What do you want? If I was going home, 
to take a pocket full of watches with me. I'd be a colonel in no time, I'll bet you. It's a good idea. Good night. Guzienko. Well, Guzienko, all packed and ready to go? That's coming, Ranyev. Good. I'll see you before you leave. Kuzenko went directly to the Justice Building. Convinced that the information he carried must go to the highest level of government, he was determined to see no one less than the Minister of Justice. Sentry. I couldn't tell him anything. How could I trust him? They'll be searching for you at 12 tomorrow. I know. I'll go back to the Justice Department first thing in the morning. You and Andre will come with me. I won't leave you here alone. We'll come. What are those? Diaries. Cables to and from Moscow. Agents' reports on the atomic bomb, high explosives, radar, false passports, even notes on a secret meeting between Roosevelt and Churchill in Canada. A hundred documents. The whole story in the agents' own handwriting, what they've been doing in Canada. They'll surely kill you when they find out. I tell you, the minister will not see you unless you tell me what... But you must understand, please. I cannot tell my business to anyone but the minister himself. Why not? It's a matter of great secrecy. It involves the Canadian and Russian governments. The minister's in his other office, at the parliament buildings. Perhaps if you go there. Thank you. We will go there. Telephone his apartment? Strange. Call me when he gets in. Hello, Lanyev. Kazinka is late for work. And it's after two. Please, we've been waiting for two hours. Time is important. I'm terribly sorry, but the minister is running way behind with his appointments. If you can come by tomorrow, we may be able to fit you in somewhere. No answer. I'm afraid there are documents missing from the files. What kind? We are checking now. Kazenko was beaten. 
His story was too big, too incredible. If the Canadian government would not listen, then he had risked everything for nothing. Then suddenly he remembered what he had learned about the Canadian newspapers, their independence, their freedom. They were his last hope. Excuse me, please. Could you tell me where to find the editor? He's out. It's very important. Try the city desk. In the corner. I have some very important information for you. Sit down. No, thank you. I'm from the Russian embassy. I have some papers here that can prove it. Well, go ahead. I can listen to you at the same time. Some papers that will prove that Soviet Russia is operating a spy system in Canada. Go ahead. This document will prove that one scientist working on the atomic bomb is giving information to the Soviet military attaché. There's no time to lose. Already they're looking for me. You must print these right away. Before they kill me. Sure. Before they kill you. Your life's in danger, isn't it? Well, you take that stuff to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. They'll take care of you and those Russians, too. But the Canadian people should know as soon as possible what they... What, what these people... Of course they should. But there's nothing I can do with this. You must do something. It's for the safety of your country. Have you been to the Justice Department? Yes. They wouldn't see me. Sorry. The government won't touch it. I guess it's too big for us to... Excuse me. The unhappy man. Some crackpot. believe me. They must. What are we going to do now? Go home and pack. <laughs> you, you worked with him every day, day and night. Couldn't you feel something was happening to him? Was there no hint of anything? The secret police takes care of feelings and hints. He may have gone directly to the police. If he has, we'll demand that he be turned over to the embassy immediately as a deserter. He will say he stole embassy funds. And we will be in the newspapers, we will be investigated, we will be arrested. Friends we have developed will be frightened away. Organizations that we have built will collapse. And the work of many years, my work, will be completely wasted. We have checked every hotel. We're watching the railroad station, bus stations, the airport, the main highways. There's no possible way for Guzyanka and his family to leave Ottawa without being seen. What about his apartment? He wouldn't dare go back there. Where else could he go? He can't walk the streets of Ottawa all day and all night with a wife and an infant. He would eventually go home, realizing you're too stupid to believe he'd dare go there. We'll go to his apartment.
will come here any minute now. You must take Andre someplace where you'll be safe. A hotel, some other city. You will come also. I must be here when they come. But they'll kill you. Anna, it's you and Andre I'm doing this for. Please don't make it worthless. You will pack now, Anna. Take this. I'll get you more. Go to the Royal Hotel. Wait for me there. If I'm not there within... Vinyakov. Has he gone? No. Anna, we won't be able to leave now. Come with me. Hurry. next door. No, wait there. If anything should happen to me, turn these over to the police. Tell them the whole story. I won't go without you. Anna, please. There's no time. Come on. What are you going to Please hurry. There's no time to talk. Come on. You see, Edgar? You know you're there. Let us in. Good evening, Comrade Gazienko. Sit down. We were worried about you, Gazienko. Thought perhaps you were ill. You are ill, aren't you? You must be. You've been working too hard. You had a nervous breakdown. Your mind is temporarily affected, isn't it? Have you lost your tongue, too? He will help you to find it if we must. Your mind snapped. That's what happened. Didn't want to leave this lovely apartment, this plenitude of food, this easy living. Couldn't face going back to Russia. And so your mind snapped, didn't it? Don't be stubborn, Gazienko. You need only to return the few unimportant papers you took from the files while you were so upset. It will be all forgotten. I haven't got the papers. Where are they? Come on, Colonel. You must be patient with the person who is sick. You see, Gazienko, we don't want to harm you. We understand. Now, where are the documents? 
Are they here? Search. Stand up! Trigorin, must I remind you you're speaking to a sick man? Help Pushkin, please. Son, you don't really expect me to answer that question, do you? I was just curious. There is no use searching here. It is obvious that his wife has the papers wherever she is. That should not be too difficult to find out. Trigorin is not as patient as I am, or as understanding. Perhaps it would be better if we all go to the embassy. I'm not going to the embassy, Ranyev. I'm not going anywhere outside this house. Alive. You are sick, aren't you? Sick, maybe. Sick like Major Kulin was sick. You have a father, Gozienka. You have a mother, a brother, and a sister. Your wife has a mother, a father, and two sisters. All living in Russia. They had nothing to do with this. Exactly. They have nothing to do with this. And yet, you didn't think of them, did you? You didn't think of what might happen to them. We heard them break in. We called the police. What's going on in here? Who are you? We are from the Soviet Embassy. Uh, Guzienko is one of our employees. He was recently ordered to return to Russia, but he decided to disobey orders and desert. Naturally, we couldn't permit that. We came here to... to reason with him. They came here to kill him. What have you got to say about this? What's happened to you? Why don't you speak? Anna, go get the documents. This is a most embarrassing situation, officer. As I have told you, this man is a Russian national who refused to return to his homeland. Actually, I think he's ill. In any event, this is strictly an embassy problem of no concern to... Anna. Give them to the officer. Those documents are Soviet property. They were stolen from the Soviet embassy. I must warn you. Unless you return those documents immediately, I shall be compelled to report you to your government. Well, this is kind of getting over my head. I, I, don't, I don't know. Officer, those are not only papers. They're a death warrant. When I gave them to you, I sentenced myself and my family and my wife's family to execution. We must all die sooner or later, so it doesn't really matter. It's how we die and why we die that's important. Take them away with you. And take my wife and child. This man is insane. As a representative of the Soviet government, I demand that you hand me those documents. You say they were stolen? Yes. Stolen property must be identified and claimed at police headquarters. That's the law. You will hear from my government. You will go now. You must not let him go. They'll come back. They'll never let him go. Anna, Anna, please be quiet. We have nothing more to say. We'll put you under protective custody until the government looks into these things. Come along. Oh, you can... They're going to listen to you. They're going to listen to you. If you run out, you admit guilt. That puts the whole party on the spot. You've got to fight this thing from the floor of commons. Use every parliamentary trick you know. You've got to stir up the front organizations, the sympathetic newspapers and periodicals. 
Start them howling about forgeries, about witch hunts, about violations of democratic rights. That's fine. What if they send me to prison? You'll be a martyr. And by the time you get out, you'll be a hero. And will you be a hero along with me? The party comes first. What about Igor Gazenko? If he goes unpunished, others might do the same. Don't be too unhappy, Leeds. We'll name a city after you when we take over. Moscow, urgent. The following members of the staff of the Soviet Embassy in Ottawa, Canada, will return without delay to Moscow. Comrade Nina Karanova. Comrade Lieutenant Pyotr Sergeyev. Comrade Colonel Alexander Trigorin. Comrade Ilya Raniev. Comrade Kulin will be pleased to see us. <laughs> Leonard Leeds found guilty, sentenced to six years. Helen Tweedy pleaded guilty, sentenced to three years. Donald Class found guilty, sentenced to five years. Dr. Harold Preston Norman pleaded guilty, sentenced to 10 years. William W. Hollis found guilty, sentenced to four years. Of the 18 arrested, two pleaded guilty and eight were convicted. Today, Igor Kuzenko and his family live somewhere in Canada. By special act, a grateful country has granted them all manners and liberties, franchises and privileges of our dominion of Canada, and may use and enjoy same freely, quietly, and peaceably as British subjects. But they cannot enjoy these rights. Their lives in danger, they live in hiding under the constant protection of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Yet they have not lost faith in the future. They know that ultimate security for themselves and their children lies in the survival of the democratic way of life.